Hi everybody, welcome back to the show. Thanks once again for tuning in. Today I'm joined by Dr. David Bell. He's a senior scholar at Brownstone Institute uh, and he's a public health physician and a former medical officer and scientist at the World Health Organization. He joins me today to talk about the World Health Organization's proposed uh, global pandemic preparedness architecture and what that means for a country's sovereignty. So please welcome David to the show. David, welcome to the show. Um, it's great to have you here uh, with me. I'm a big fan of uh, your work and I've read uh, several of your recent pieces uh, about the World Health Organization, uh, which is where I want to start. I want to start by asking you uh, about your piece in The Daily Skeptic that the World Health Organization's draft legal instruments would, quote, fundamentally change the relationship between the World Health Organization, its member states, and their populations, promoting what you say can be described as a fascist and neocolonialist approach to healthcare and governance. Now, end quote. Now, I would, um, you know, when, 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 you know, people like Leslie Lewis, the politician, the conservative politician, say this, she's branded as a conspiracy theorist, and, and it's not just her, but several, um, you know, others who pointed this out say, oh, this is, this is just a conspiracy theory, there's no such thing. Could you expand on this? Could you explain your concerns about this proposed global pandemic uh, preparedness architecture? Yeah, thanks, Rupa. Um, yeah, it is difficult to talk about because of that. And I, I mean, I actually think we've been sort of trained or programmed was to think, you know, conspiracy theorists, therefore don't listen to that person. I used to be like that all the time. Um, until, you know, COVID sort of opened my eyes, I think, because, you know, my background is in infectious disease outbreaks and WHO and big philanthropy and so on. And um, so I, I could sort of see this coming and understood there's something wrong. So then I looked a bit deeper. But, uh, yeah, it's difficult. The, so the WHO was set up as a um essentially a so it's run by countries one country one sort of vote in the world health assembly it came out of the aftermath of world war ii with you know fascism in europe and there's decolonization going on globally so it sort of started in that spirit and it was very strong on community-based care um countries having their own control of health care etc uh, and it was funded in, you know, to a large extent in that way, based on GDP of countries. But it's all moved to um, the funders tell WHO what to do for eighty percent of its funding now, either specified or thematic funding, it's called. And uh, a large part of that funding, a minority, but it's probably twenty twenty five percent, is private um, individuals or corporations. Uh, you know, the second largest donor is the Bill Melinda Gates Foundation. Mm -hmm. So. It's an organization that is um, instructed by its funders, which are countries with their own self-interests and which are private individuals with big, um, you know, mostly pharma or big interests in pharma and software. And we can you can see how it's changed in its emphasis um, over the last 20 years to very commodity-based, you know, pushing vaccines, et cetera, mm -hmm. over community care. So, uh, you know, fine if there's a balance, there clearly isn't now. And there are other organisations that have arisen beside it, CEPI, which is just for pandemics and vaccination, mm -hmm. GAVI, which is just for vaccination. So these are all commodity-based, and public health has sort of moved from the idea of people deciding on their own health care to people taking commodities um, mm. that are given from a central level. So, so, um, so what do you what do you mean by community care in the context? Uh, you know, how do you how would you define community care? Well, OK, decentralization for a start where people and you know, public health has to be decentralized if you're going to do it properly, because life is complex, disease is complex, populations are, and their behavior are extremely complex. Mm. And, you know, I don't know the priorities of a, a woman in Burkina Faso and her sick child. I don't know the priorities of someone in Japan, but I might know that there are certain threats to the health and I might have, you know, some expertise in malaria or in you know, gastric cancer in Japan or something. 
So I can give that person information, but they need to make the decision on how they use that in the context of their life. And this is basic in public health. We even know that in public health that if you take decision making away, people worse off. So the, the Whitehall studies in the UK are, are pivotal in, you know, in showing this in that people who have less decision making, less social capital, they're much that they have shorter life expectancies um, for a whole range of reasons. And uh, so, I mean, that's leaving aside the issue of human rights and that if we are sovereign individuals, the government should be dependent on us, not us dependent on the government. So, Was human rights uh, an important uh, part of the uh, World Health Organization's, um, uh, uh, you know, vision when it, when it started out, when it first came about? It, it arose in that era. So there are yeah. certain things in the constitution. It, I mean, it's not a human rights body, but it, mm -hmm. it, it was from the era of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, et cetera. Okay. And, and there are various, you know, there's the Helsinki Accords and you know, the Nuremberg Code is well known that the WHO is supposed to agree with, which um, are very strong on the idea that individuals cannot be told what to do with their health. Um, that they have to have a choice. So, uh, but I mean, WHO, it's important here that it's seen as a, uh, is a tool of what's going on. It's not, WHO is not trying to take over the world. Uh, WHO is being used by people who would very much like to have that sort of power. Mm. We've seen through COVID, these same people who were pushing the agenda and the response to COVID, which is being now has been, far more harmful than COVID would have been, um, even just on health, leaving aside the social consequences. So these people have gained massively to the tune of, you know, hundreds of billions, probably trillions of dollars, while most of the world is becoming impoverished. These are the same people who have been changing this agenda in WHO and who are now pushing the pandemic preparedness agenda that goes forward. So that they are, you know, it's corporate authoritarianism, which was one of Mussolini's definitions of fascism. That's what they're trying to do. It's the idea that large corporations and sort of the technocratic type approaches um, are the best way to control the world and to, you know, save it from itself, as they would say. And so they think that, and you can see this in the World Economic Forum, the way it functions and that they see themselves as the repository of knowledge and expertise, and they have a right for the rest of the world to, to, to tell the rest of the world how to function and what to do. Mm. And so WHO has become part of this. Um, yeah. So uh, let's go back to the uh, global pandemic uh, preparedness architecture. Uh, you've expressed some great concerns about these uh, amendments, legal instruments. Um, can you tell us what what exactly um, you know is problematic here? And uh, yeah, let's start with that, and then I'll ask you a couple of follow up questions from that. Yeah. Yeah, there's two two instruments. One's a, um, what they call a treaty or an accord. The other one is the the international health regulations that have been around since the 1950s in different forms, um, but it's amendments to those, and they're the important ones. So. The international health regulations are supposed to help countries sort of coordinate in times of diseases crossing borders, essentially pandemics. And almost everything in them is voluntary. It's a recommendation. So the main change is that that recommendation is essentially becoming mandatory. So countries undertake to follow the recommendations. And the, the wording non-binding is actually crossed out in the current amendments. But so these include things that we've seen in COVID, like border closures and um, mandated vaccination, mandated medical examinations, mandated um, testing, uh, quarantine, et cetera, so incarceration of individuals. And I mean, we, we saw this in an unprecedented way from national governments. What this is doing is saying that an individual in Geneva, the director general, should be able to essentially mandate these and the countries will undertake to follow. The other thing it's doing is greatly expanding. So it doesn't, the, the, the scope, so it doesn't have to be a demonstrated harm to health. It can be any sort of threat and the surveillance mechanism that's funded, particularly through the treaty mechanism, 
is there to find viral variants and you know any nature is full of viral variants that's how you know evolution works that way we constantly viruses change and any of them could you could all a threat and therefore you can declare an international emergency and put these powers in place so in reality they're almost never a threat so we've had you know since the spanish flu where most people died through lack of antibiotics mm -hmm. secondary infection there's in the 1950s we had hong kong flu in the 1960s asian flu you know killed a million people less than tuberculosis does every year and that's about it until COVID. So, you know, something like SARS-1, it killed 800 people. It, it's, it, it's not even a, it barely, you know, classes mm -hmm. an outbreak in terms of other diseases. So th this is, it's not a real threat unless someone is releasing viruses or allowing viruses to be released from a laboratory or something that could be harmful. But it is, from nature, we don't see this threat. And historically, the, the idea that, you know, we've been told that because of habitat destruction, there's more and more contact between humans and wildlife. And that's a threat from, you know, coronaviruses and bats, which is, I mean, it's just silly because when you destroy habitat, you destroy the wildlife. They don't move into cities, they die. Um, and, you know, we used to live with bats in our houses all the time. Now we don't. So human animal interaction is greatly decreased and is decreasing all the time. So, it, you know, the the basis of what we were being told as this existential threat is is false, but it's repeated over and over again, as you would if you you know with these sort of totalitarian totalitarian ideologies, and it's not being questioned at all in the media. You know that you know we will be assuming that these threats are getting more common, getting more deadly. They're not. They're getting less common. They're getting less deadly, and the risk of them is much, much lower, you know, putting aside man-made threats mm. um, from a laboratory. What, what if the people drafting this, uh, these, these amendments, um, I know this sounds like a conspiracy theory, but um, I'm going to ask this anyway, uh, because I, I think um, it's, it's based on something you, you just said a few minutes ago, which is, your assumption is that these viruses are just naturally occurring as they always have. Uh, but what if there is a nefarious agenda somewhere, some lab somewhere, uh, or some, 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 some country is developing, uh, let's pick on a country, North Korea, for example, is, 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 is doing something um, uh, to that effect and they release a virus or something very deadly into the atmosphere. Um, uh, now that would be seen as an existential threat. It's not seen as it's, it's, it's something that's been manufactured and released into the environment would then in that, in that kind of context, would a, pan, a, a pandemic preparedness, uh, architecture of the sort make any sense? Well, absolutely not because North Korea has just been elected to the, um, the executive board of the WHO. Okay. What else got to say? So, I mean, so, I mean. Yes, that is a potential threat, and it has mm -hmm. been for a long time, I guess since World War One, really. Yeah. You don't deal with that by handing powers to a body that has far less expertise in your country, is far away from your population, mm -hmm. and is instructed by essentially military dictatorships, which are competitive to yours. So in China, for instance, is mm -hmm. yes, it should be involved in the WHO. But the WHO then should not be in any position to tell us what to do as countries. Yeah. So same with North Korea. So it would make no sense in that situation to delegate any authority or decision-making power mm. to the country, to, to an organization that is influenced by the country that's causing the problem. Yeah. Well, so, and you said, you said something interesting that non-binding has been taken out of uh, th these, th this amendment. Uh, you know, my position was always, well, you know, it's an international organization. None of this is binding on any country. Um, how exactly would you go about enforcing this? Why would a country like um, North Korea agree to this? Why would China agree to this or Russia for that matter? Okay. Yeah. A few reasons. One, they'd agree to it because they don't care and they would never intend to mm -hmm. do what it says. 
Yeah. So, you know, obviously China is not going to take instructions from the World Health Organization. I mean, yeah. It's a non-starter, yeah. Um, small countries, small medium countries might have to because there may be sanctions from other countries. There may be World Bank influence, IMF influence, et cetera, because, I mean, the World Bank is very involved in the pandemic preparedness agenda, et cetera. So mm -hmm. they will push this and make it very difficult for countries not to comply. Mm -hmm. The the US has um, legislation, the National Defense Authorization Act 2022, that includes wording about complying with, you know, following the IHR, supporting that, and um, addressing countries that don't abide by the IHR. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't say how, but there's a clear intent in the writers of that, that countries should be ab abiding by it. So and, and, you know, the, the, the top of countries is often, as we know, not it's not the people necessarily that is being reflected. And, you know, we go back to who is funding the WHO, the, you know, the World Economic Forum, which is a club, corporate club of a lot of these people. They have said, uh, Klaus Schwab, the head of it, has said, um, you know, they have infiltrated cabinets. They have a very strong influence on decision making in what we thought were Western democratic countries. And they're very open about this and about how they do it. So there are a lot of ways that um, they also, you know, the, the larger members of investment houses and so on who sponsor the World Economic Forum also own larger shares in a lot of the large media operators, including AP, Reuters and so mm -hmm. on. So the, it is going to be extremely difficult if this is in place for most countries not to comply because if, or for a politician to stand up against it because of the weight of the media, the court, the force of the corporate force, et cetera, the other countries that have vested interests in this. So, you know, the WHO doesn't have a police force, but, you know, this is, we have to see this as, again, as part of a much wider movement. Um, you know, we see it also with, I mean, with the climate emergency agenda, et cetera, where, we have this, I mean, it's interesting because we have the same funders behind it, the same modelers often or same institutions doing the modeling. We have the same sort of vilification and, you know, conspiracy theorist type labeling mm -hmm. of experts who disagree with the main narrative. And the same people are gaining from it, we gain from COVID. So, you know, I think there's... We, we have a situation where some people in the West have gained so much wealth and so much power that they can now sub, you know, subvert and take over these agendas, which have a legitimate basis to them often, and use that for very different interests. Would you say that the pandemic, uh, you, you know, you talked about how uh, community care is, is, is what's relevant here and not a one size fits all kind of approach that we saw during the pandemic. Uh, would you um, say that uh, the World Health Organization's evolution from being focused on community care to, as you describe, um, essentially so, so, try, being like a, a, a pharmaceutical giant, right? In a sense, selling commodities and that kind of thing. Um, do, you, do you find that the World Health Organization's credibility has been shattered uh, um, uh, because of how they responded to the pandemic? A lot, among a lot of people, but perhaps not among most, I think most people still, it's hard to tell. I mean, a, a lot of people still think that um, the response was appropriate and was based on public health. I mean, it clearly wasn't. We knew from the very beginning that the tactics used would cause far more harm than good, that the average age of death was 75 to 80. They had comorbidities. We knew this was very early 2020. So it was clear, and you know, it's even more extreme in most of the world, low middle income populations. So we knew that the response was wrong. We, so it was very clear that WHO was doing something which would cause massive harm and was undoing a lot of their work over the last two, three decades. Mm. But I, I'm not sure that most people understand that because they are just bombarded from the main media with this same message that there's an existential threat, pandemics are getting more, you know, more dangerous and more frequent, 
and we have to let these experts save us from them. And, you know, I think there's a discomfort, I think, generally that something is wrong, but I don't think people are really understanding the tactics that are being used. Yeah. And and how likely do you think these, uh, how likely is it that these instruments uh, will end up uh, um, making it to the final uh, document? Uh, how, how likely is it that they're going to pass? Uh, very highly likely, I think. Um, There'll be some tweaks, uh, you know, there's clauses where the WHO can take intellectual property from countries and give it to competitors, et cetera. Those sorts of things may come out because they may actually harm the sponsors of this as well. But by and large, there's a huge momentum here, not from people and populations asking, asking for this, but from the sort of international bureaucracy that is pushing this. There are, I mean, if you want to get a job in public health, in global health, this is where you go now. You stand against it, you're in a very difficult position. So most of the people in the field will back it or say they back it because that's their livelihood. Yeah. Um, the media is backing it. So it's very, it makes it very difficult for politicians. I think quite a lot of politicians are realizing that something is wrong, um, but not enough to stop it. I, I think. I mean, what may happen is that this will go through, it'll prove a disaster and people will start, you know, defunding the WHO, getting out of it, et cetera. But that's going to be difficult. You know, that's going to cause a lot of pain before that. Um, I mean, my hope is that it won't go through. My hope is that there'll be a dramatic change that some large countries will just say, you know, the, their populations will tell their politicians that this is unacceptable to be, corralled and used by a health organization that has poor expertise and has nothing particularly to do with their country in order to enrich a, a few. But people have to realize that first and it's very difficult to get that message out. And has there been uh, that kind of pushback at all from uh, any country? I don't think from any country. Uh, yeah. th th there was a round of amendments that the US put up um, in so 2022, and only one of them got through, which is to shorten the period that you can opt out of these things. Mm. But and other countries push back on them. But I think that is much more likely because there's a huge amount of money on the table here. They talk about ten and a half billion a year extra funding, etc. And in those amendments, all the funding seemed to go, or most of it, to high-income countries and people in them. And yeah. I think other people want a slice of the cake. So I think there's more interest in, you know, they can see this happening, the, the bureaucracies at the top of health, and they want their part of it, rather than thinking this is fundamentally wrong from a public health point of view, it's going to harm health of our populations, and therefore we should oppose it. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that you mentioned is that the this, according to this, the World Health Organization will have the power to um, uh, take away uh, uh, patent rights and intellectual property rights from uh, pharmaceutical uh, companies uh, who are on board with this, with this, uh, with these amendments. So why would they, why would they sign on to something like this? Why, why is there no pushback from that, from that se section of the? Um, from, yeah. So, so I, that's what I suspect. There's bits like that that I suspect won't get through, and you know, it, it's difficult to know when this is done, and you know, mm. how much is intended to get through, how much is, you know, put in there so that we can haul it back and make it look like we're listening to the people. Um, there, there is a review by a, a review committee of the director general, but it was an external review, and it's actually quite a good one looking at these. Um, that pointed out that some of these would be non-starters from a, a legal point of view within countries. And so that couldn't happen. The, 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 I mean, the amendments are put by countries. I think it's about 15 countries put amendments. It's very difficult to know for a given amendment, is this actually a country saying we want this or is this a much more powerful country using that country as a proxy or is it pharmaceutical interests using that country as a proxy. It's hard to know, you know, with every amendment where it comes from. And it's not like there's one person sitting there writing them. So right. the, the, the thrust of it is very clear. 
but there's going to be some back and forth on some of the details. Yeah. Um, I, in, you know, in several of your uh, writings, you've expressed concerns about, um, um, you know, the pharmaceutical and biotech industries gaining more influence. And uh, how, how is that changing the, uh, the landscape in terms of global health? Uh, you know, what, what, are, what are the potential consequences of this? Much poorer health. Um, so it, if you look at low middle income countries, for instance, uh, the best way to improve health, and this isn't um, a theory, it, it's well accepted, is improving access to very basic health services. So that mean, means just having good basic clinics with uh, you know, the basic commodities, basic antibiotics, basic healthcare, maternal care, etc. Um, and it means getting access to that. So having a lot more clinics, a lot more health workers. Uh, no one makes a big profit out of that. It's good for the economies of these countries. It's good for the communities. They can have better health, allows you to have a better income, et cetera. But no, no one is going to fund the WHO lots of money to do that because, especially private funders, because they need a return on their investment from WHO. So to get a return on investment, you need to sell a commodity essentially or a service. And that means, you know, you can sell vaccines, you can sell other drugs, you can sell diagnostics, but you, you can't sell basic primary health care um, to make a profit, certainly for, you know, for a large company. So, um, you know, it, so it, Essentially, the, the funding has moved WHO in that direction. It's, it's commodity driven. Um, and we are now, uh, you know, we are taught now in medical schools and so on that vaccines have been this massive impact on health. Mm. Um, you know, I was taught in medical school, and it's not that long ago, it wasn't, you know, 17th century, that, um, <laughs> that, and the graphs are there that most of the improvement in, say, more developed countries, you know, higher income countries, occurred through sanitation, better living conditions, better nutrition. And even diseases like measles, they came down very low mortality before vaccines came in. So vaccines have been important in a lot of these diseases in getting the, you know, getting them a little bit further. So we've got 95% down, it gets another 3% down. But they haven't been the main reason for the improvement in life expectancy in wealthier countries. And the, the same, you know, people die in low income countries because of diseases of malnutrition, diseases of neglect, et cetera. And vaccines will help a little bit, but you will make far more improvement by improving nutrition and improving sanitation, improving living conditions. And again, so, so you know, this is not a new idea in public health, but it is something that we've moved away from because public health is now funded by people who will benefit from a very different approach. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about this World Bank Fund, um, which, which um, is now tied to the World Health Organization. And you've... Uh, I think you've you've expressed concerns that this fund would uh, compromise uh, the World Health Organization's autonomy. Um, could you explain to us what what you mean by that? Yeah, I haven't said that. that there's the World Bank's got a financial intermediary fund, FIF. Yeah. Which, yeah. So it, it's essentially a parallel track to the, and this comes back to the World Health Organization is not running the agenda here. They're a tool of yeah. mm -hmm. bigger players. Yeah. The World Bank is a tool, it appears, of bigger players as well. And you know, we just saw the leadership of the World Bank change because the previous director, CEO, or whatever, he, he accidentally pulled some common sense on climate, um, which didn't go down very well. So <laughs> so now we have another one. And mm -hmm. so, you know, who makes a decision on who is the head of the World Bank and what they're allowed to say is very similar to, I think, who, you know, who is directing the WHO. So the WHO would be a technical um, partner, a technical lead on that World Bank Financial Intermediary Fund. It's just more money for this agenda, more money for surveillance, so that they can find threats, so that they can lock down countries. They'll have a 100-day vaccine from CEPI, 
the 100-day vaccine will be touted as this is the way out of the lockdown that we just imposed on you so that you can get mm. your life back together and see your grandma in a nursing home. And therefore, you have the vaccine, and then you know you'll, you'll be you'll be given a little bit of freedom again until the surveillance finds a few months later the next threat, and they lock you down of another mm -hmm. hundred day vaccine. So the the WHO is part of this. The World Bank is part of this. You know, the World Economic Forum is very strong in pushing this agenda. The UN is talking about this sort of emergency thing as well. So. It, um it, it's you know it's a movement we need to address what's happening at the who but we need to see that this is a much bigger movement which in a way isn't surprising you know people have got a small group of people got extremely rich proportion to everyone else they use they will use that as any human you know most humans would unfortunately because we're often driven by greed to control the agenda so that they can get even richer so is that what is at play here? Because that was going to be one of my questions for you. I mean, what is the objective here? Why, why is the World Health Organization being used as a tool uh, to, um, you know, to, to pursue this? I mean, wh what exactly is the end game here as far as someone like a Bill Gates, the Gates Foundation is concerned? So it's hard to know for sure, isn't it? And, uh, and there's, I'm sure there's not one agenda. I'm mm -hmm. sure that people in you know, who are gaining from this and pushing the agenda have different interests. Uh, I think one is just a business deal, and you have Vanguard and BlackRock, State Street, et cetera, who are invested in these pharmaceutical companies, that are heavily invested in the media, they're heavily invested in software, et cetera. They're the biggest shareholders in all mm -hmm. of those categories. So to them, using them together to... Um, control the agenda and extract more money from people, which is what happened in COVID is plan, you know, is the basis of the pandemic preparedness agenda. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, that is in their interest. That's their job for their shareholders. Yeah, their job is to maximize returns on all their portfolio of investments. So they're doing that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you have to put aside morals and human rights. I mean, they don't, they're not really tied to national borders, so they don't have a, a problem with, you know, one country versus another. So if you're sort of amoral in your approach to business, then they're doing the logical, rational thing. Um, I think some, you know, some people maybe just have a, a bit of a, um, you know, desperate need for self-fulfillment by controlling other people. I don't know. And the, the richer you get, the more sort of away from basic values of life you get maybe you get more and more susceptible to that yeah um now I, I don't think you know people talk about you know trying to decrease population that sort of thing i'm sure a lot of the people there would like the world to have they think the world would be better off with less population I and mean, they say that that's very different from killing people to get there and i i, I can't see that but I, I can see that they don't care much, for instance, with the mRNA vaccines. They don't care very much if people, if there are a lot of side effects and, you know, there are some yeah. adverse consequences. And I think some of these people think that they're doing good in doing that. So, the, you know, the, they think that they, they're the repository of knowledge and expertise and they have um, the right, therefore, because they're smarter and they're better that they have the right to tell other people how they should live for these other people's good. And, mm. you know, again, we get back to sort of fascist approaches to life and, you know, the, you sacrifice some or you vilify or degrade yeah. some, et cetera, for the, the greater good or what they perceive as a greater good. Um, you know, you, you mentioned earlier that uh, according to this new architecture, you know, we're kind of in this... Um, uh, constant game of uh, trying to identify new variants. Um, how can you, um, I mean, one, one, one um, purpose, I mean, an important purpose uh, is to identify variants so as to, or viruses or anything out there so you can, you can, you can, you can um, effectively deal with it. So how do you, how, you know, how do you still, how do you strike this balance while ensuring 
um, you know, while ensuring effective responses to um, an emerging health threat, for example? Yeah. So one way is to look at disease burdens, and we normally do that in life years lost. So if a child, you know, 95% of malaria deaths are under five years of age, they're young mm. children. They, each of those children le- loses, you know, 70 years of life. The average person who died from COVID, say in Canada, was I think about 83 or 85 or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they're already sick. So they probably lost six months of life on average, something like that. Maybe a year, but probably not because they're already quite sick, most people. So in you know, if you look at that and we say COVID is one of the worst ones you've had for a long time, which we're being told, that doesn't compare with all most of the other diseases we deal with. And this is why I think early in COVID, we just got mortality numbers, mortality numbers. It was never age, it was never life years lost or disease burden as we used to describe yeah. pre-2020. And so yeah, so, so we yeah, it's um so I'm losing my thread here, Rupert. <laughs> no, it's okay. Take your time. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I think. Um, sorry, ask yeah. the question again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, it's um, you know how do you strike this balance between finding new variants and viruses and uh, um, and 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 also being able to effectively deal with um, emerging uh, 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 health threats. Yeah, so if you're going to spend $10.5 billion, $10. billion extra on trying to yeah. find these viruses, yeah. and you're only spending $3.5 billion a year total in the whole world on malaria, mm-hmm. I mean, it's just ridiculous, yeah? Or tuberculosis kills 1.6 million people a year. It's going up, getting worse at the moment. Mm. We spend about the same on that. I mean, it's, you know, it's a few billion rather than 10 and a half. So firstly, it, it makes no sense to spend this amount of money on this problem. Mm. Um but secondly, what are you then going to do? So it's pretty clear that none of the measures against COVID, um, certainly not lockdowns and you know these stupid um, you know business closures or um, curfews, etc. Yeah, yeah. Um, helped, and it's clear that closing schools didn't help. It's clear that masks didn't help. Yeah, certainly not measurably. And it's there's pretty good evidence that certainly if you look at all cause mortality, the vaccine hasn't helped either. So none of these things helped. So what are you going to do with a an aerosolized respiratory virus? There's very little you can do uh, except encourage people to be fit and healthy and to live more normal lives and improve their innate immune response which is the opposite of what you do if you shut people down and keep them out of parks and keep them out of gyms. Hmm. So, I mean, one thing you can do for pandemic preparedness is to have a fit and healthy population and to emphasize that. Um, But even then, you also have to decide, you know, what is important in life. And this comes back to this whole thing that is going on and the other, you know, what else is driving these people? Um, You know, is avoiding death, you know, even living another year from 80 to 81, mm. is that the most important thing in our existence? So, you know, how many of these old people who died in nursing homes after not seeing their family for a year, how many of them would have rather died, you know, taken the risk of dying months and months earlier, but yeah. seeing their grandchildren a few more times? And I would guess most of them, probably. But, you know, different people have different values and that's why they have to make their own decisions. But we are being told that everything everything about life is centred on avoiding dying. Mm. We're not giving a way of doing that. We've seen all-cause mortality increase over the last two, three years. You know, after COVID has gone down, probably as a result of... Um, the lockdowns and so on and the harm that they did and perhaps some vaccine injury as well. But we, we're seeing mortality increase. So the response has been really poor. So, you know, what are you paying for when you do this? Well, I that's a very interesting point you raised because a few months ago I, um, I had um, 
Thomas Fauci uh, on my show, um, the author, co-author of a book called COVID Consensus. And uh, his book makes a very similar point that uh, death um, is, you know, such a normal part of people's lives in the rest of the world, except in the West. And, you know, and this was the first time, I suppose, that we came so close to, I mean, it was just all around us in a, in a sense, or at least that was the perception that one had. There was a perception, um, but it wasn't true, was it? It, yeah. it wasn't people dying in the street. It wasn't the Black Death. Well, l- let me let me push you. Uh, I mean, uh, push push back a little um, on that. So, how do you then explain Italy, for example? I remember that when when Italy went into a lockdown, and then you heard these minute by minute uh, breaking news uh, reports uh, on social media that you know. 500 people have died today in Italy, 700 people, now it's up to 600, and now and now it's up to 700. Every day, like like seven, 800 people were dying. Uh, in Italy, you saw people, you, you, you know, and there were, uh, you, could, you could hear ambulances in the background, you could hear sirens going off. What was that all about? And the media are good at that. Um, so it's easy to show a line of ambulances at a hospital. You can do that almost any time of year if you go to the right place at the right time. Mm. The So Italy was interesting, northern Italy. So there was a, a very steep increase in mortality in these municipalities and then a very steep decrease. Sometimes this happened in one municipality, but mortality was normal in the other one. So somehow mm-hmm. it wasn't crossing the border, arbitrary border between them. Yeah. And it started with lockdowns. There wasn't a huge mortality and then they locked down. They got a couple of cases, they locked down and then the mortality went up. So it's suspicious that at least a large part of this was due to the measures that were taken. So um, if you get a a frail elderly person with a, a respiratory virus infection and you put them on a ventilator, you paralyze them, you put them on a ventilator, you don't let anyone in the room, you do barrier nursing, so they're not being regularly turned, they're not getting chest physio, you're not getting them to ambulate because they're paralyzed on a bed, Mm -hmm. then there's a very high probability that they will die. And this is just basic medicine, it's basic care, we know that. This is why we have chest physio, this is why we encourage elderly people to ambulate and be active as possible because they need to you know, keep their lungs clear and they, you need to avoid bed sores and all these other problems of inactive elderly people. So, and, and, you know, ventilator-associated infections are very common if you put a tube down a person who's already immunocompromised. So we know in New York, for instance, Northwell Health published it, I think it was about June, they published the data for, you know, what happened in New York. And about 85, 90% of the people who were intubated died. Yes, ventilators played a very big role in uh, early. In fact, there were these uh, scientific papers that came out. I, I remember just reading this, revisiting this last week, uh, because it, it seems it, it seems like one of these issues that's just um, this just completely disappeared from the conversation. Uh, there were these papers that were the scientists making a very strong case for why aggressive early ventilation was necessary to prevent the disease from uh, uh, progressing from mild to severe. And so, uh, you know, pretty much every anybody who went to the hospital, I suppose, went on the, on the ventilator. Um, you know, I really wonder, like, where is the accountability here? Like, I mean, where, where? I mean, some of this was panic, I think. And you can't blame people for panic when everyone's panicking. You've got the governor of New York jumping up and down, screaming for more ventilators or everyone's going to mm-hmm. die, etc. cetera. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, but what you should do in these situations, by and large, you know, generally, is positive air pressure ventilation, which, you know, so you put a mask on with a bit of positive pressure, keeps the lungs inflated, et cetera. And that's pretty normal. Um, that's what they eventually move to for most cases. But why, yeah, why they didn't do that first up when we know this is basic. And another reason for the ventilation that was put very early on was to protect other staff. And, yeah. you know, 
we, but we knew in March, it was published in The Lancet in March, that mm -hmm. almost no one in the age group of the people who were looking after these patients was going to die of COVID. So we knew that from China. It was the, the Pure College published it. So, you know, they, they were minimal risk. And as soon as they had COVID, they were almost no risk because, as we know, and as was shown over and over again, post-infection immunity is very, very strong. And the, the Greeks knew this back, what, 450 BC or whatever in the Athenian plague. Yeah. Well, you know, to that, uh, so two questions for you. Um, one, we were told, look, COVID is not like a any other, every other respiratory virus out there or any, or every other respiratory virus that we've dealt with uh, over the decades. And so it's it's a very different virus. It does all of these crazy things to your body no one is immune from it it, it you know it affects everybody uh and uh, so you better take precautions and um i had a second question but i have brain fog maybe because of covid long covid or whatever it is that i have <laughs> um and and so you know we, we oh yes yes so i remember during um delta i remember uh you know here in ottawa uh, a doctor uh, told me, look, uh, you know, uh, Rupa, you got to be very, very careful. Uh, I see, I'm seeing lots of young people show up at the hospitals. Uh, a lot of young people have been admitted. So, so the two things, so, so one, one, uh, the fact that, um, you know, young people were largely immune from this or, or, or not, or, or would be safe from COVID. Yeah that was that you know and then i started questioning that and then of course i don't have expertise uh to to you know to you know that where i can say uh that covid is somehow less severe than every, every other respiratory virus out there so you know i kind of had to accept what was being said to me um i mean what 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 exactly was going on there i know so it's, you know, it's not less severe than every other virus. It, it, there are characteristics of, around COVID. There's, um, you know, the, the loss of smell is unusual in other viruses, but very common with, with COVID. So it does seem to affect people differently than other viruses. Uh, the, it appears that there was a, a more severe lower respiratory tract, so lung pathology in mm. partic particularly elderly sick people. Uh, you know, it's hard to know how much of this is ventilator related and so on as well. But it mm. appears that there is a slightly unusual sort of, um, you know, fluid on the lungs, interstitial edema. Called, um, so this gram grass appearance on x-ray before people were intubated. So it, it, normally coronaviruses are upper respiratory tract. It seemed to be affected lower more, and that's probably related to the AC inhibitors which mm. are common in the lungs and it, it, it binds to. So it, it is you know, a different disease than we had seen before, but not that different. Yeah. Um, you know, we knew that, as I said, that very early on, that it was almost exclusively old people that were going to get, mm. and sick old people who were going to get severely ill. Um, we, and, and, you know, just because it's slightly different, you lose smell, is a little bit more lower, lung pathology that doesn't mean you throw away a hundred years of learning on how to deal with that problem from zero which we seem to do and and that was yeah that was a very strange thing and i mean you hear anecdotes but a, a lot of the doctors in these hospitals knew that this didn't make sense knew that this wasn't how you should deal with this sort of infection but they were being told by the administrators this is what they had to do they were being told by uh, you know higher up that this is what they had to do. And in the end, most doctors chose to comply with this rather than say, this is against common sense and our medical training. We can't do this as doctors because we're in charge of the treatment. Yeah. So, you know, the government seemed to be in charge of the treatment, not the doctors and the doctors complied with that. Yeah, I mean, I wish I had heard this message uh, during the pandemic. Look, yes, this person who's a marathon runner, um, you know, and, and does triathlons and all of that, got COVID and had to be put on a ventilator. But that is just an anecdote, and it doesn't necessarily 
necessarily apply to every healthy young person out there who runs marathons and is physically fit. Uh, we just we just never got that kind of messaging. In fact, we were told, no, look, if that's this can happen to this person, it can happen to everybody. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's pretty silly, isn't it? Like, you know, mm. it, it never go through a, near a cliff because occasionally people fall off a cliff. I mean, yeah. no, seriously. And yeah. the, you know, the, I mean, we, we just saw figures from Israel that I think no young, healthy adults, not a mm. single one died of COVID. And, you know, that there are pictures, I remember a picture on the BBC, I think, of um, someone in Wales who, and it was, you know, young fit man in his 30s in ICU with COVID. And here's, here's someone who's, you know, looks like 120, 150 kilograms mm. lying on a bed, grossly obese, um, obvious risk, risk factors for a severe viral respiratory infection. So the, there was this, the media was massively exaggerating. They were calling... Um, people who were you know they're calling people young fit when clearly they weren't young and fit that doesn't yeah. mean occasionally this can happen I, i've seen a young fit woman in her 30s um tragically die of influenza um within 48 hours of you know, getting sick in you know as a doctor so this can happen occasionally people do die um but people we knew that people would die far more if we impoverished them if we stop them from going for checkups for chest pain or, you know, cardiac monitoring, so if we stop them going for cancer screening, we knew that that would kill people too. Yeah. But we decided that this incredibly low risk of the odd person, very rare fit person dying from COVID massively outweighed all these known risks that we have, you know, a normal medical system to deal with. Yeah. Uh, the only way I can see that, I mean, the only explanation I can have for that in the end is it was a business deal. And there is someone who could see that they would make a massive gain, a massive profit from this, and they were stoking the flames. And that's not a conspiracy theory because, I mean, we have Klaus, you know, Klaus Swab at the Swab at the World Economic Forum writing his book with Terry Mallard in um, mid 2020 saying you know COVID actually wasn't too bad but they had to use this to push their agenda mm. um we we had you know the P software people then then followed by pharma making hundreds of billions of dollars out of yeah. this yeah I mean the CEO of, I saw a video clip of the CEO of BlackRock saying we're trying to change behavior uh we're uh we're, we're just quite disturbing you know all told uh yeah, um, it's disturbing that most Western or all Western um, governments now seem to have behavioral psychology units attached to their uh, governments and their cabinets. Um, we should be extremely disturbed by this. It's the same thing as you were saying with BlackRock. It's, yeah, they are there to manipulate the way people think to get them to follow a certain um, agenda, which the government thinks is important for them. Yeah. Yeah, you know, most most political parties will think the most important thing is they get back into office. So it should be a, a non-starter within a democracy. Yeah. Um, so uh, any any uh, any final thoughts on uh, where where we uh, where we're going with this? The World Health Organization um, in terms of future uh, threats um, uh, to our health. Um, you know, I, I, I suspect, I, I feel like, you know, based on my conversation with you that we haven't really learned any important lessons here. And, uh, we're, you know, I feel like we're, we've actually drawn the lot, the wrong lessons from the pandemic, the way, uh, it was managed, uh, at least based on these amendments that you described to us. Um, you know, where, where does one go from here? Do you, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future? Yeah, I, I don't think most, I, I don't think that people running this are trying to learn lessons. I mean, they're, they're following an idea and an agenda that they've had for a long time. And they're just following it. So, you know, yeah. they're, they're, they're pushing this pandemic agenda on the idea that um, we didn't respond fast enough. And, mm -hmm. but they can't show any evidence at all that mm -hmm. that made any difference. So, in the end, so, um, 
you know, it's just, it's silly and they, they know it's silly, but they're saying it because it plays well in the media and they need that. But the, so the, the people running this, I mean, they're not, they're not stupid in that way. They know that, that they know that they can tell lies and the media will present them as the truth and mm. they can get away with it. And they have censorship on their side so that they can keep the story strong. Yeah. Um, I think with WHO, you know, I think it's useful to have international health organizations that can advise when they're asked for it and do a bit of coordination when they're asked for it. They need to be small. I think any institution gets to a point where it's outlived its usefulness. The people within the institution see preserving the institution as more important than its, its original mission. Mm. And it's clear with the WHO that that's happened. But it doesn't mean there aren't some experts of the WHO's work that are still really helpful. Of course there are. But overall, I think it's, for the last few years, it's probably been a negative and not a positive. Yeah. And it's going much more in that direction. It's just clear from, if you look where the money is flowing, it's not to the disease burdens anymore. It's to this, eventually into the pockets of pharmaceutical companies. Um, so I, I think extracting countries from the WHO or any organization that acts in this way is important now um, because you can't put the rights of people in a democracy in the hands of private interests or organizations strongly influenced by private interests and by other national interests that are contrary to your own values. That's just yeah. a non-starter. That They don't have the expertise that most of our countries have. So that's a non-starter, just be stupid. Yeah. And they're pushing an agenda which it is false. I mean, pandemics, unless someone is making them, mm. are not becoming worse and more people are not dying. So, uh, you know, it, it, it is a, a bad idea based on falsehoods as far as democracy goes. If you're into fascism, you're into corporate authoritarianism, you think you just want people to tell you what to do and you don't want to think for yourself, then maybe it's okay. But we hope that most people aren't thinking that way. Um, but I, I think it's important to see that this is way beyond the WHO. So we've got to, uh, we've got to somehow rethink Western democracies, don't we? I mean, you know, what happened in Australia, where I grew up, is it's a bit beyond me that you can have black-clad armored, you know, body armored policemen hang off the sides of armored cars driving through the streets of Melbourne and then shooting rubber bullets of people who are protesting about not wanting to wear a face mask for a virus that kills people in their 80s. Uh, yeah, it's a bit hard to grasp, but that did actually happen <laughs> over Gosh. and over again, that sort of stuff. And, and yeah, beating up people in the street and all, all, all that stuff happened that we saw and yeah. in many countries. And, you know, do we want our society to go that way if we don't we've really got to have a fundamental rethink of you know the, the way we distribute wealth the size of governments the um you know the, our local level how involved we get in politics and so on ourselves are we just going to sit back and let all these other people run it for us and just comply or are we going to get actively involved and try to change it yeah well, on that very um, poignant note, and <laughs> um, um, you know, I, I really um, appreciate you coming on the uh, show, David. It was a real pleasure, and uh, um, thank you for sharing your insights with us. And uh, and I hope you'll be uh, back soon. Um, hopefully, we'll have. Um, uh, made some progress uh, with these instruments, with these amendments, with the World Health Organization, maybe. Hopefully they're just, you know, essentially killed or that, you know, more countries will push back against it. But that that's the hope. But uh, but thank you. Thank you for uh, uh, for for uh, for coming on to the show. I really appreciate it. And I hope to see you again soon. Thanks. Sir. OK, take care.